Do you think that the booming rich should pay a bit more in tax, a fair share of tax, so we can invest more in our crumbling public services? Do you think that our key utilities, like energy, for example, should be in public hands rather than cash cows for wealthy shareholders? Do you think that private businesses have no place in our national health services because they put profit before patients' needs? Do you think that students shouldn't be saddled with debt for daring to dream to your university education from which all of society benefits? Do you think that we should support trade unions representing, I don't know, nurses, paramedics, care workers, teachers, public servants, transport workers, the pillars of our society, keep our country ticking day after day, when they take action to stop their wages collapsing and to go on strike to improve their often woeful terms and conditions? If you believe those things, then Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, has told you to go and take a running jump. That's really what his speech this week was all about. Now, I know a lot of attention has focused on his treatment of Jeremy Corbyn, his predecessor, banning local party members from being able to have a say about whether they reselect Jeremy Corbyn as their Labour candidate for them to make their own decision, which is despite a promise in the leadership election that members should be able to choose in all cases, who represents them without interference from the leadership. Let me just deal with the Corbyn issue first. And I think, to be honest, you should park what you think about Jeremy Corbyn and focus, I think, here on the issue of integrity and what sort of politician that Keir Starmer, who is almost certain to be the next Prime Minister, what sort of politician he is. Now, of course, Keir Starmer served in Corbyn's shadow cabinet. In fact, he owes his political career, as it is now, to being appointed as Brexit Secretary, where he was able to flaunt his Remain credentials, which was crucial in becoming the successor to Jeremy Corbyn. He campaigned, of course, for Corbyn to become Prime Minister. Now, here's what he said in 2017. Do you want to see Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister? Yes, absolutely. This is a, uh, an election about the future of our country, um, and it's a choice, a stark choice, between a Labour government and a Tory government, uh, and whether we want Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister or Theresa May. And um, I want uh, Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. Yes, I'm a now, again, in 2019, he said he was 100% behind Corbyn. Let's have a listen. I'm 100% behind Jeremy you, Corbyn. You I'm, are now. <laughs> I, I, am work, I am working with Jeremy Corbyn yeah. to try to win the next general election. Now, after Labour's terrible defeat, when he was campaigning to become leader, he described Corbyn as a friend and a colleague. Let's have a listen. I'm not going to rank Jeremy Corbyn. He's a colleague. He's a friend, and he's led us through some really difficult times in the Labour Party. And I don't want to trivialise that by giving him a number out of 10. I respect him um, and thank him for what he's done. Now, on the question of anti-Semitism, Keir Starmer defended Corbyn from those charges. Let's have a listen. You're loyal to Jeremy Corbyn, and you've spoken in his defence just now. But Louise Elman says that he is a danger not just to the Labour Party, but to the entire British Jewish community. I don't accept that. I don't accept that. He also passionately denounced how Corbyn was treated by the media again during the leadership election uh, weeks after Labour's terrible election defeat. The attacks on Jeremy Corbyn in that election we've just had were terrible and they came back at us on the door. They vilified him and they knew what they were doing and they knew why they were doing it. So now, without due process, he's publicly thrown to the wolves a man he once described as his much maligned friend, his unfairly maligned friend, banning Labour members from making a decision themselves about whether he stands or not. Now, let's move on to the politics, because Keir Starmer's speech was supposedly in response to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission taking Labour out of special measures over the issue of anti-Semitism. Now, obviously, the evil of anti-Semitism has to be confronted, and you'd hope that a political consensus should be built on that particular issue. The problem is Starmer used his speech to launch a more general attack on the left. Intentionally, I would say, based on what he did, given it was a speech supposedly about anti-Semitism, but then went into other areas, blurring what should be the serious issue of anti-Semitism with his political objection to the left. Now, an attempt to end that demarcation, things you don't agree with the on the left and the issue of anti-Semitism is actually really gruesome because it you know, it's attempts to link left-wing politics in general with anti-Semitism, which is outrageous, but also makes it harder to fight anti-Semitism. Now, here's what he said. We have changed from a party that looked inward to a party that meets the public gaze, from a party of dogma 
to a party of patriotism, from a party of protest to a party of public service. Change is never easy. And I understand that some people won't like the changes that we've made. But I say this with all candor. The Labour Party is unrecognisable from 2019, and it will never go back. It will never again be a party captured by narrow interests. It will never again lose sight of its purpose or its morals. And it will never again be brought to its knees by racism or bigotry. If you don't like that, if you don't like the changes that we've made, I say the door is open and you can leave. Now, what does he mean here? Because obviously the vast majority of us would object to dogma or looking inwards or being a party of protest. What he's talking about are the political changes that he's made since he became leader of the Labour Party. And he's justifying those changes with that kind of language, which no reasonable person would disagree with. What matters is the substance. The problem is those political changes that he's made represent a total abandonment of what he promised in the election, including the 10 pledges, which he quite notoriously made in order to get elected leader of the Labour Party. So what he's essentially saying there is if you don't like the very things that Keir Starmer stood for to become leader of the Labour Party, then you can go and get out of the Labour Party. Kafka-esque, I would say at this point. Let's just see in terms of how he's dramatically changed and the, sh the changes he's made, which he's saying, if you don't like, get out of the Labour Party. Um, for example, he promised to nationalise key utilities when he was running to be leader, and then when he was elected leader, claimed he'd never made such a promise. Now, judge this for yourself, because this really is a question of honesty and integrity. You made 10 policy pledges for this campaign. Let's see how watertight they are. Can you guarantee that under your leadership, the 2019 Labour commitments to nationalise water, energy, rail, the Royal Mail, They'll all be in Labour's next election manifesto. I've made that commitment. So I didn't make a commitment to nationalisation. I never made a commitment to nationalisation. Now, just to really drive this home, in the leadership campaign, he stuck his hand up when asked on national television on the issue specifically of nationalisation. First of all, raise your hands if you're into scrapping tuition fees. That's everyone. Renationalising water and electricity. Yeah. Look, you can't distort reality. It's clear what happened there. When he was running to be leader, Keir Starmer committed to nationalisation. After he became leader, he claimed he never made such a commitment. That's dishonesty, isn't it? There's no way around that. It's just clear deceit. Someone's capable of that kind of deceit once. They're capable of deceit over and over and over again. And just to really round this home, pledge five of his ten pledges was common ownership. Now, you think that actually in Heinz, well, not at the time I thought this at the time, but you might think, well, that's weasel words because common ownership, and this is what he tried to say afterwards, can mean any old thing. What did he say? Public services should be in public hands, not making profits for shareholders, support common ownership of rail, mail, energy and water, end outsourcing in an NHS local government and justice system. Well, <laughs> doesn't really give much room for manoeuvre there, does he, in terms of they need to be in public hands, not making profits for shareholders. That means energy companies, for example, that aren't run for profit for shareholders. So what, what other models does he mean other than public ownership? Yep. Um, Starbuck also promised to increase taxes for the top 5%, but now he says this. We have got the highest tax burden since the war, and therefore, you know, the scope for high tax increases is simply not there. Well, first off, the tax burden for the rich is not the highest since the war for the rich. And the overall tax burden in Britain is way lower than other European countries. Now, do any of you think Germany is a basket case? Because Germany, on average, the average German citizen is 15% better off than the average Brit. So, obviously, the idea that a more progressive tax system what well, leads to terrible ruin is not borne out by the facts. There is no basis for Keir Starmer to abandon his leadership commitment other than he has simply decided that he doesn't support increasing taxes on the rich, which is not what he promised members. Now, in the leadership election, Keir Starmer also pledged to end private sector outsourcing in the NHS. But he's abandoned that promise as well, saying there will be more use of the private sector under Labour. 
He also promised to scrap tuition fees. Let's just, for example, hear what he said. But on this specific promise, it sounds very much like you are going to also to ditch your promise to scrap tuition fees. And there may be very good reason for that. I'm not saying it's the right thing or the wrong thing to do, but I think not very subtly, you're basically saying that that promise is also for the chop. What I'm saying, and I think most people watching this, looking at the chaos of the country, the damage that we've done, is that we'll go into that election ensuring that every single commitment that we make is fully costed. I think what and people every listening will hear, Kirk, your summer, actually, is you I do not want, saying you're still going to scrap tuition fees. On tuition fees, I want to see change. I don't think it works. But I've said at my conference speech last year, um, there are things, good Labour things, that we would mm. want to do, but because of the damage the Tories have done, we won't be able to do. Mealy mouth stuff. Mealy mouth stuff. He's scrapped it. I mean, he's not... The, Labour's not going to put scrapping tuition fees in the next manifesto. And in terms of changing circumstances, well, the lot of younger people has got significantly harder. The, the, you know, younger people have been screwed over very, very much over the last few years. And actually allowing new generations not to be saddled with debt because they went to university would relieve a huge amount of pressure on younger people whose living standards have fallen, who can't, you know, who are being ripped off in the private rental sector, home ownership collapsing amongst them. A, a, you know, tuition fees is essentially adding an 11% income tax to those younger people over a certain amount. Now, again, the basis for abandoning that is clearly that he made a promise which he has reneged on. That's what's happened there all over again. Supporting trade unions, again, in the election, he went to picket lines and said it was important for politicians like him to be there, and now he's banned Labour shadow ministers from doing so. Take a listen. I don't want Labour MPs on picket lines. It's really important you get politicians to come out and support you uh, and stand with you in this. So I'm very proud uh, to do that, to be with you this morning and to support you through this campaign, both as the local MP for here, but also in the shadow cabinet uh, and as running as leader of the Labour Party. Brazen. I mean, just what do you say there? In the leadership election, he's like, yeah, I need to be, people like me need to be on, the tr on, on picket lines. And then when you actually get a popularly supported, because the polling shows huge amounts of popular support for those strikes, then he bans them, his um, shadow ministers, from going on picket lines. Look, we could go on, couldn't we? Uh, but I'm not going to because I'd be here all day. And that's the problem. You know, the, the issue is is dishonesty, obviously, and deceit. Anyone who claims that he wasn't dishonest is themselves being dishonest. <laughs> Everyone gets tired with dishonesty if you, you know, if you support a leader who's dishonest. You end up, you know, the, a, a fish rots from the head down. But it's worse than that because things like public ownership of our utilities, higher taxes on the rich, scrapping tuition fees for younger people, or um, supporting trade unions when they go on strike, that's supported by millions of people. Millions of people support those things. And they deserve some form of political representation. Their voice should be heard in politics. But by not only waging war on those policies and scrapping those policies, but also trying to wage war on the left, there was an attempt to drive from politics altogether people who support ideas and policies supported by millions of people. That is terrible for democracy. And that's why some of you will go, I know, Ooh, why are you attacking the leader of the Labour Party? What about the Tories? I attack the Tories all the time. Look through my YouTube channel um, or my podcast. Don't, I don't need lecturing on that because that's the vast majority of what I do. This is the government in waiting. And we need to scrutinise all frontline politicians. That's my job. I'm an independent commentator. But at the end of the day, there's a democratic question here. Do you banish people from politics who represent ideas that millions of people out there support including the things that many of you watching or listening to this support. And what are you doing to democracy? If not only do you abandon promises you make, therefore undermining people's faith in democracy, but you, you, you basically purge those ideas from politics altogether. That's dangerous for democracy. And that's why this is far bigger than Jamie Corbyn. It's far bigger than the integrity and honesty of Keir Starmer, for which I think I have proved provided conclusive evidence that he's lacking in both areas. This is about our democracy as a whole. And there is very, very few things that are as sacred as democracy. Please like, subscribe, and support us on patreon.com forward slash ojoes84.